Hi, church. I'm glad you're with us. Grab your Bible, if you would. Open up to Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 25. Matthew 11, 25. We're going to hear now the word of the Lord. Let all who have ears hear. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thanks be to God for this word. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we praise you for your word and the time to be together, to gather around it. Father, nothing matters as much to us as the revealed will of God where we learn of you and we hear from you and you lead us and guide us and you train us and this word is living and active it's like a sword a double-edged sword that goes into us and divides and shows and reveals and judges so through all of that Lord I pray in Jesus name that what comes out of this time together will be great joy and deeper understanding, <clears throat> more love for you and each other, uh, uh, a little further along in sanctification. And I pray that what comes out of this doesn't last just today, but resonates in our heart. Lord Jesus, these are your words, and you are gracious enough to preserve them for us, and we have them, and we have them in our language, and we don't take it for granted. We praise you for it. Now, bless the preacher. He needs help. And I pray, Father, a blessing upon all the hearers that all of us who hear your word would surrender in obedience and submission. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the observant who are listening right now are saying to themselves, wait a minute, that's what he preached last week. That's the same text that he preached last week. So, all of a sudden, we see not too much has changed with him. Uh, even if we're not gathering, he ends up coming back at us with another one. And it's true, but a little different this week, because I had full intention of returning to the Gospel of Luke today. <coughs> Pardon me. As a matter of fact, I had spent a great deal of time last week in studying uh, this passage in Luke that we were ready for, meditating on it, getting ready, but in the midst of it, um, there was a lot of unrest in me about this passage of Scripture, uh, the words that Jesus said in verse 28 uh, through 30 about coming to him if you're burdened down and heavy laden and finding rest for our souls, taking his yoke, it's, it's easy, the burden is light. All of that kept stirring in me in a way that was distracting and the first thing on my mind when I woke up in the middle of the night, the first thing on my mind when I woke up in the morning, but I kept kind of plowing ahead <clears throat> with this study in the Gospel of Luke. And finally on Thursday, I, I looked at the clock out of curiosity. Finally at Thursday at about 11.20 a.m., I got my tablet out and a pen and started writing. Because when I'm not sure <clears throat> what's going on in me, I start to write. I think it was Calvin that said, I learn as I write and I write as I learn. And that's so true for me. Things can come clear. I can discern what the Holy Spirit's doing in me when I just start writing out. I want to read you a little bit of what I wrote because I think it'll help you understand why we're back here. And what it ended up being was, it was about me, what the Holy Spirit was doing. And therefore, I think it's about all of us. Here's what I wrote. I love knowing that Jesus wants my soul to be at rest. I love knowing that he wants for me exactly what I know I want, 
an inner life of peace and rest and joy and satisfaction. But it also feels very discouraging to me. Discouraging because it is too often not my experience. I think I felt hypocritical preaching last week. I'm aware each week that what I'm preaching by God's will and His grace is thoroughly biblical, but I always know I come up short and have far, far uh, to go in my growth. As a matter of fact, the longer I live, the more broken I feel. I think what I am seeing is it isn't so much that I'm discouraged that I don't experience the rest in my soul that the Savior offers, but that I seem to seek this rest for my soul in so many different ways instead of coming to Him. My flesh shouts and fights against the rest Jesus invites me to experience in Him. The ways my flesh wants me to go find natural I find natural, feel natural, while coming to Jesus for the rest that he offers feels so unnatural. Last week when I prepared to preach, I knew that I was going to spend time, not spend any time in the hows of coming to Jesus. As I write this on Thursday of the following week, I'm not sure why I avoided that, but I suspect it was because It is a way and a fight that I too regularly avoid. I don't bother with and go about soul rest in other ways, some of which look really good, while others are downright ugly. I think what I'm sensing in this unrest in my soul is I need to think and pray and meditate more deeply about this and then share with my church family what I sense the Holy Spirit saying. So that's what brought me to this. And it was at that time I, I took all my study notes from the Gospel of Luke and put them in the in-process file and set it aside and leaned back and said, okay, Lord, what? What are, you, what are you saying to me? What are you doing? What are you stirring? Why am I here today? I, I cry uncle. I, I want to do this again. I want to find. I want to hear. So what is it? And When I get to this point, often what I like to do is write out as many questions as I can and just write them out and and hopefully start getting some notes and hearing the Spirit, and those questions drive me to the Word of God. Some of the questions come directly out of the Word of God, and it starts leading me, and I feel like I was led at that point. Now, let me just say what you're going to get in the rest of this sermon from Jesus' words in Matthew 11 is not the end of the story. It's not the end of the all. It's not going to be some kind of revelation that's going to fix anything or everything in you or me, but you're going to get the process that I feel the Lord has me in, and I want to invite you into that process. So here's the questions that I want to answer for you, or at least consider with you. If you're taking notes, number one, What does Jesus have in mind when he says soul and when he says rest? Number two, what does soul at what does a soul at rest look like? Number three, why am I so resistant to coming to him for this rest? And number four, how can I willingly move toward Jesus to accept his offer for rest for my soul? That's what I want us to think about. First, what did Jesus have in mind when he said soul and when he said rest? I felt like that's the starting point. I want to know as closely as I can to what Jesus had in mind and in his heart when he made this offer, when he gave this invitation to the crowd that was around him. It's the invitation that I hear that's for you What does he mean when he says soul? Well, we have to remember that Jesus was a Jew. Jesus grew up in a very strict Jewish home. Jesus grew up in a home that observed all the Jewish traditions. Jesus was immersed in in the Torah and Jewish holy scriptures from his childhood on up. Jesus visited and went to the synagogue when it was open. Jesus was a Jew, raised in a traditional, uh, strict Jewish household. And so 
his idea of soul is something we have to understand. I want to hear. I want to know what did the Jew in those days think when they heard the word soul. The Hebrew word that's translated soul most often in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word nephesh, spelled N-E-P-H-E-S-H, for those who are interested in words uh, like me, for those who are nerds like me, N-E-P-H-E-S-H, nephesh. And nephesh is translated soul in most places over 700 times in the Old Testament, but it's a little unfortunate that we have a mentality of soul that is incomplete and really doesn't match that Old Testament uh, Jewish mindset for soul. You see, nephesh literally refers to the entire life, which would include your spirit, your mind, your heart, your will, your emotions, your body, and your day-to-day -day existence in life. That's soul. It's all inclusive when they use that word in the Old Testament. It did not just refer to the immaterial part of who you are. In other words, how I say it often or how I think about it, it it's not just who you are minus your body. That's not how they thought about soul. When they thought about soul, or when they said soul, or they were using it in a context, they were thinking about the entire being, the entire life. So, for example, the psalmist writes this in Psalm 119, verse 175. I want to give you two passages, and I want to read them, then go back and put nephesh in where those words are used. The psalmist writes, Let me live so I can praise you, and may your precepts help me. Well, the word live is nefesh. Let me have life. Let me continue to have my life. Don't take my life from me. I don't want my life to end. Give me my life. Sustain my life. Give me my life. What I think, how I feel, my will, my body, my daily experience. Give me my life because if I keep my life, then I can praise you. And I can be guided and directed by your law and your precepts. Psalm 42 is pretty familiar. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before him? As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my nephesh pants for you. You see, there, there's this automatic inclusion of body, isn't it? Because the psalmist is using this image of drinking. The psalmist is using this image of a, of a parched mouth, thirsty. As my nefesh uh, thirsts for you, O God, my nefesh thirsts for the living God. My life, I want my life to be satisfied by God. Everything about me, I want for God and, and to find satiation like we do for thirst. I want to find satiation for my entire life from God. And it includes the body, the soul, according to how they understood it and how they taught it and what they believed was everything. And it just makes sense to me because you really, in, in some respects, cannot separate who we are. We can't compartmentalize it. And so think of it this way. When there's turmoil in your life, right, when there's suffering and hardship and tribulation in your life, it obviously has hold of your mind, it has hold of your heart, it has hold of your emotions. It's affecting your entire inner person, but it also does your body. You might not be able to sleep. You might lose your appetite. Uh, you might develop an ulcer. You might get heartburn. You might have headaches. So when Jesus looks out at the crowd... And he says, come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, as I kind of summarized that with burden last week, I want to again, come unto me, all who are heavily burdened, and I'll give rest to your soul. I'll give rest to your body. I'll give rest to your mind. I'll give rest to your emotions. I'll give rest to your disposition. Everything who you are, I want to give rest to. It's an amazing invitation from our Lord. 
So what did he mean when he said rest? Well, the good thing about that is that that word rest means exactly what it does in English. So I uh, just opened up Webster's Dictionary, and I wanted to look through the different definitions of rest, and there's a lot. So let me just give you a, a few of them, short ones, but that's what Webster had. Rest means, number one, to lie down. Rest means, number two, to cease from action or motion, to refrain from labor or exertion. Number three, um, to rest means to be free from anxiety or disturbance. Uh, number four, to sit or lie fixed and supported. And the last one is to remain confident and to have trust. That's what rest means. That's how we understand rest. That's what this means. What Jesus is saying is, if you're overwhelmingly burdened, Come unto me, and I want to give your life, I want to give your existence a, a freedom from anxiety and disturbance. I want to give you a support under you. You'll rest on me so you'll know you're supported, and that will give you a confidence and a trust in you where you can cease from all this labor. You can cease from all this trying. You see, primarily this invitation really is about salvation, isn't it? You don't have to earn your salvation any longer. Come unto me, and I'll give rest for your soul. I'll release you from the burden of the law. This is the time of the new covenant. The kingdom of God is here. And then in this ongoing life of the follower of Christ, he keeps inviting us, come, 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 and I'll give rest to your soul. That's what he means when he says this. We've got to know that Jesus is thinking of our whole person, and he does not want us to be disturbed. He does not want us to toss and turn at night in worry and anxiety. He doesn't want us to be vexed. He doesn't want us to be joyless and hopeless and to feel helpless. That is not the will of God for you. I love that about our Savior. I love that about our Savior. He said after teaching in John 15 for a little while, listen, I'm telling you these things not so you'll have more burden, I'm telling you these things so that my joy would be in you, so your joy would be complete. Because listen, gang, I want you to have filled up joy in your soul. I want your life to overflow with joy. He said in John chapter 10, you know, I've come to give you life, but not just life, but abundant life. What you're living apart from me is not abundance. I want abundance for you. I'm giving you my peace, he said. Not as the world gives am I going to give you, not that peace. I'm giving you my peace because I want my peace, the peace that's in me, in my existence, in my life, I want to give to you. Hear this offer that the Savior is extending to his people. He loves us so much. He wants what actually in the deepest parts of who we are, we want. You see? So that's question number one. Number two... I want to ask and hopefully answer, what does a soul at rest look like? What's it look like for someone when their soul is at rest? Because even though I just explained a little bit about what he meant by soul, what he meant by rest, I think it's more discerned. I think we understand it better to see it than to have it explained to us, than, than to read about it, let's see it. And when I thought this way, Thursday afternoon, maybe Friday, um, the pages of Scripture are filled with people who had their souls at rest. Let me start with the, the, the best, and that's Jesus. Do you remember that time when he was on the boat and a big, huge storm broke out? A dangerous storm broke out. He was in the boat with his guys, and all his guys were scared to death. They were going to die. Where was Jesus? He was sleeping. He was in another part of the boat, and he was sound asleep. While all this storm was going on, can't you see it? Waves coming over the side of the boat, wind rocking the boat, claps of thunder, lightning lighting up all of the area around them. Jesus is asleep. He's slumbering. He's taking a nap. And they go and finally wake him up and say, don't, don't you hear what's going on here? Don't you feel this? Don't you care that we're about to die? And Jesus, I'm sure, thought to himself, okay, here's a time where I can manifest my deity. And he stood up and looked out over the squall, and he said, that's enough, be still. And whew, it, he brought nature 
to rest. And then he looked at his guys and said, where's your faith? What does a soul at rest look like? It's sleeping when there's this rocking and reeling of life all around it. That's what it looks like. We read about a gal who I just love and can't wait to meet in heaven. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, her name is Hannah. She's married to a guy named Elkanah, and Elkanah actually has two wives. The other one's name was Penina. Hannah and Penina were his wives, and Penina was very fertile and gave Elkanah a lot of kids, but Hannah couldn't. She was infertile, she was barren, and she could not conceive and give her husband children. This so deeply depressed and disturbed her, she could not escape it. It was all-consuming to her. Read 1 Samuel 1 later. You'll see that this is true about her. She was overwhelmed with grief. And what compounded her grief was that her fellow wife, her sister wife, whatever they referred to them as, was cruel. Penina was a mean, mean old gal. And she poked fun at Hannah. She kept bringing it up to Hannah. She kept... Uh, making Hannah feel even worse than she did about it. She elevated herself and made herself look better and that she was doing more for their husband than what she was. And this just compounded and increased the grief that Hannah felt. We read in 1 Samuel 1 that one afternoon she finally left and went by herself to the temple. And she went in the temple and she fell to her knees and began to pray. And the text tells us that while she was there praying, she was weeping bitterly. As a matter of fact, I jotted down some of the descriptions that 1 Samuel 1 uses at this time for Hannah. Deeply distressed, vexed, anxious, bitterly weeping, deeply troubled. And she goes in the temple with this state in her. We're also told that she wouldn't eat. Her husband, even in 1 Samuel 1, said to her, It's okay. Am I not enough for you? Sit, eat. You need to eat something. But she wouldn't eat. So she goes into the temple and she prays, and she's weeping bitterly as she prays, and she's praying so intensely, she's not praying out loud, but her lips are moving. And it looks so different than what the priest was used to. He actually thought she was drunk and when she was done, he said, what are you doing drunk at this hour and coming in the temple? And she said, I'm not drunk. I am, I am just so wound inside me. But we're told that after she finished praying, she went home, and here's what the text tells us. Literally, her face lightened up. Her countenance lifted. And then I love this. You know what it says? And she ate. <laughs> what, what does a soul at rest look like? A soul at rest can have a countenance that's light-looking and can have an appetite in the midst of some of the most painful disappointment that one can imagine. That's what a soul at rest can look like. Let me give you one more. Once there was a king in Judah, his name was Jehoshaphat, and word came down to Jehoshaphat that there were several nations around Judah who were coming together as a coalition to attack Judah. And Jehoshaphat knew that Judah was a sitting duck. There was nothing they could do about it. They were going to be overpowered without question and destroyed. Uh, Judah didn't know what to, or excuse me, Jehoshaphat didn't know what to do. So he gathered the people and he got on his knees and he began to pray. What the scripture says is that he turned his face to seek the Lord. 2 Chronicles 20, by the way, if you want to read it later. He turned his face to seek the Lord, and he prayed. And what a powerful prayer he prayed, acknowledging the loving, sovereign control of God over everything. And he ended his prayer by saying this, We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And then it says the entire nation began, at the conclusion of that prayer, to worship God and praise and give thanksgiving to God. What, what does a soul at rest look like? It looks like someone who is worshiping and praising 
and feeling and expressing thanksgiving when all around them is out of control and they should rather be fearing and biting their nails than worshiping and giving God thanks. That's a soul at rest. I hope you see it. I hope you do. The third question that I wanted to bring to you, the one that I was really considering in my study is, why in the world am I so resistant to come to Jesus for the rest that he offers? Because I am. If you need a pastor who has it all together, you need to turn this streaming sermon off and go find one. I think you'll have a hard time, but there may be some who make you think they do. I have no problem telling you I don't. And as I look over my life, I am resistant to coming to Jesus more times than I would want to admit to find rest in him. It feels so unnatural to me. Um, there are other things that my flesh says, go there, go there, go there. That'll make you feel better. That'll bring you satisfaction. That will um, uh, uh, satiate your desires. That'll get you through the day. And some of those things look really good. Some of them look like ministry. Maybe doing for the wrong reasons. And some look really ugly and are just outright sin and wrong. Whatever it is, these idols draw us to find rest. And why am I so resistant to that? Oh, I just kept going over and over in my heart this week. Why am I so resistant so often? And the big general answer is pretty easy, isn't it? It's all because of my grandparents, Adam and Eve. Your grandparents, too. You know what? They lived in the Garden of Eden in absolute perfect rest that they were finding in Yahweh. They, they found all of their rest and peace, and it was unadulterated, it was unbroken, it was perfect in Elohim, you see. Until that day, that infamous day, the day that truly lives in infamy up to this point, that infamous day when something was brought by the enemy to them that tantalized them. And what I'm about to say is true, though I'm superimposing it over the text. Essentially, what the enemy was saying to them was, you've been finding rest in God and he's lying to you. There's other places that you can feel better. There's more for you in life than what he is and what he offers you. And they bit, literally, didn't they? They bit. And from that point on, they passed that disposition on that I'm going to find rest and satisfaction in all these other places other than Christ. Because that's essentially what sin is, my friends. Sin is seeking out anything and everything, anyone or any place, to find peace and rest in your soul instead of God. That's hamartia, that's missing that mark, the mark where you find the glory of God, that mark where you find your rest, that mark where you find exactly what your soul desires and wants. But Grandpa Adam and Grandma Eve passed this on from generation to generation to generation, all the way up to my mom and dad, who passed it on to me, and I in turn passed it on to my kid. Well, Lisa did, anyway. Got passed on to my kids, and they've passed it on to their kids, and here we are. That's, that's the general answer. And listen, it's been that way with man ever since Adam and Eve. Listen to these texts. From Jeremiah chapter 2, has a nation changed its gods? Yes. Even though they are no gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You hear it? They're looking for rest there, <clears throat> and they're never going to find it. Here's Jeremiah 6. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, listen, and walk in it, 
and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. I set watchmen over you saying, pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not pay attention. I have that in me. Or one more. Nah, two more. Isaiah 30. Thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling, and you said, no, we will flee upon horses. And the last one, Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. There it is. From that generation of Adam and Eve forward, it's been true. So that's the big general answer. But us who are in the new covenant, who have been born again with the Holy Spirit in us, what we show is that that old nature, that flesh that still is hanging around can be so powerful. I'm, I'm wondering if this is what was behind when Paul wrote, you know what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, I always end up doing. I should go over to Jesus and find the rest and, and satisfaction for my soul, but I just don't seem to do it. Let me say a word to kids. I know there's some kids and teenagers who are listening to me right now, and here's what I want to say to you. Everything that feels natural to you will not necessarily be right. That's kind of how it happens, gang. There's going to be a lot of things that you want to do, that you want to have, where you want to go, that mom and dad are going to know just aren't right for you. And if you're teenagers, you know it's not right for you. Everybody has a conscience in them, kids. Listen, that little voice that says, this isn't right. I should be listening to my mom. I should be listening to my dad. And ultimately what I should be doing is obeying Jesus and listening to him. I want you to know that it's okay in the sense that it's true for all of us, even us big people. There's a lot of things we want. There's a lot of things we want to do. And everything in us says, that will make you happy. That will be good. And it's hard when we have to say no to ourselves. It's hard when we hear no. So I want you to know that's just going to happen for life. But ultimately, listen to me, ultimately, walking and having your life with Jesus and believing him, that's where true happiness and joy and rest will come from. I hope you remember that. Um, the last question. How can I willingly move toward Jesus to accept his offer for soul rest? How can I do this? And I chose that word on purpose, willing. Did you hear that? How can I willingly move toward Jesus to, to take his offer, to receive this invitation of rest for my soul? The reason I said willingly is I don't think we should do it out of duty. And how do you not, well, you just say, well, that's what Jesus says, so I just got to do that. I'm just going to. No, I, I don't think it should come out of duty. I think we should, <clears throat> pardon me, rail against doing that out of duty and rather do it out of want and desire. And, and where does that come from? Listen, you have to think of it this way. What you will do in moving toward Jesus and receiving this invitation and offer is what you want. This is going to satisfy you. This is what you're made for. This invitation is for you. And I hear you theologians out there. I hear what you're saying. You're saying, that just feels really selfish. That just feels self-centered, like I'm doing it for me. And it doesn't feel right. doesn't feel God-glorifying. And what you're wrestling with is that me being completely at rest and doing this because I want that and me honoring and glorifying Jesus, they're mutually exclusive when that's not true. They are one in the same John Piper's taught me this over and over and over. Maybe you know the saying that he says so often that God is most glorified in you when you're most satisfied in him. And amen. You'll move towards him willingly when you say, oh man, I really need that peace right now. And I know this is the only place I'm going to find it. <clears throat> So how do I do that? And I want to say real quick before I list some things that I'm thinking about, not arrived at,
just some things that I'm thinking about. I want to say I know who I'm preaching to, okay? I know I'm preaching to young people, and I know I'm preaching to old people, some really old people. I know I'm preaching to really old people, really young people. I know I'm preaching to people who have full-time jobs and are busy, 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 and I'm preaching to retired folk who have absolutely no schedules. I know I'm preaching to young moms who have two and three and four kids in their house right now, and the minute I say, um, here's some time you need to spend, they just feel more time, more time, more time, more time, right? I get that. I don't have all the answers for you. I know I don't. But here's a little quip that I think is important and we're wise if we grab hold of it, and it is this. Time is not made, or time is not found, it's made. Okay? Write that down. Time is not found, it's made. Right? Very true. What do we say? I just can't find time to do that. Well, of course you can't. Time isn't found, time is made. So whatever that looks like for you. Here's some things I'm thinking. Number one, I think we need to stop all the ways that we're naturally trying to find rest. The Bible uses words like repent and renounce. So when you see these things, and you probably are thinking about them right now as I am, we need to stop going in those directions. You know, what's really good is some of those things will be like throwing a light switch. Boom, I'm just going to stop that. Other of these things will be lifelong struggles that you're going to need to remain vigilant and to, to use the words that Jesus said, watch and pray and stay alert. Some of them are going to be struggles and fights for the rest of our life, but we need to repent and renounce these things and say, I can't walk these paths anymore to find rest and to somehow think I'm meeting the needs inside. I can't do it. We have to start there. Secondly, we need to spend time alone with Jesus, whatever that looks like. Because what did he say? You want rest for your soul? Come to me. Well, that's, that doesn't take rocket science exegetical study of the scriptures to see. If you want this rest, you have to come to him and be with him. Listen, can we all admit that Mary was right off after all? Her sister Martha was in the kitchen and running around the house and serving and serving and serving and trying to meet needs, meet needs, and meet needs. And if I'm a betting man, and maybe this isn't fair, if I'm a betting man, she found rest for her soul where she thought she did in meeting everybody's needs and serving like that. What did her sister do? Went to the feet of Jesus. And Martha was uptight and told Jesus, get her off her duff. And what did Jesus say? No, 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 no. I'm not telling her that. She chose the better thing. Martha, she chose the better thing. We just need to admit that she was right. Mary was right. And we need time alone with Jesus. This being alone with Jesus, listen to what Dallas Willard said. In drawing aside for lengthy periods of time, we seek to rid ourselves of the corrosion of the soul that accrues from constant interaction with others and the world around us. It's a longer quote. I'm going to stop there. Isn't that amazing? What Willard is saying is, if you don't get alone, what's happening every day in your life is that there's corrosion building up in your soul from everything that you're doing, from the people that you're around, from being immersed in the culture, in the world. Your soul is developing corrosion. And being alone with Jesus is what sort of detoxifies and cleans that corrosion out of your soul. I read, I loved it, a guy who was challenged with this one time said, I'm going to do this as an experience for one month. I'm going to spend a good amount of time all alone with Jesus. And here's what he wrote at the end of the month. The more I spent time with Jesus alone, the more I appreciated the strength that I was finding. The less I became skeptical and judgmental, the more I learned to accept things that I didn't like about others, and the more I accept them as uniquely created in the image of God, the less I talk, the fuller the words are that I speak at the appropriate time, the more I value others, the more I serve them in small ways, and the more I enjoy them and celebrate my life. The more I celebrate, the more I realize that God has been giving me wonderful things in my life, and the less I worry about the future. I will accept and enjoy what God is continually giving me in my times with him. I actually think I'm really beginning to enjoy God. Don't you love that? He said, I'm just going to, I'm going to see if this is true. And that was a result. Come to me. Spend time with me. What do you do then? Well, remember what Jesus said, when you come to me, take my yoke upon me. And what is that yoke? What did he say? Learn from me. What do you do in that time alone? Listen to him. 
Learn from him. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read, meditate, pray those scriptures. Get into those scriptures. Be alone. Sometimes you just need to sit in his presence and pour out your heart and worship and give thanksgiving and pray. You've got to come to him if you want this rest. Let me mention three more quickly, okay? You need to talk to your nephesh. You have to talk to yourself. It's not crazy. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 116. Listen to the unrest. Listen to the stress and worry and anxiety. He writes, the snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. There he is praying alone with God, right? O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Now listen how he ends. Return, O my soul, to your rest. There you go. How how do you find this rest? Every now and then you just got to say, soul, time to quit and go to him. Right? Time to go to him. So, you might not want to do that in front of people, but that's what you should do. Number four, here we go. Last two really quick. Stop thinking that you need a calm life to have rest in your soul. Stop thinking. I think that way. Sometimes if I'm just uptight and stirring around, I always think, okay, if what was different would make me feel better, and then I identify these things, and I go out and try to control and make those things better so I can feel at rest. Well, that's not going to happen. Jesus promises your life, you, your soul rest, not your circumstances in life. He told you the opposite. I preached that last week. We have to stop thinking that the only way for my soul to be at rest is going out and taking care of these things. And when life around me calms down, then I'll feel calm. That's not the will of God for you. Things aren't going to calm down. They may every now and then. But he wants you to sleep and eat and pray when all around is giving way, and be at rest. Last one, come to him with others who want to come to him. We we really shouldn't do this completely on our own. Find people who are as serious about coming to him as you are, right? Don't be lazy. Maybe you need to say in your gospel community this week, on your Zoom or whatever you're doing, maybe you just need to look at each other and say, who's really serious about this? What are we going to do together? How, how are we going to make this ha- How are we going to make this an experience and a reality? Let's do this together. And if you're not in any kind of group with anybody, then, then get together with one. Join one. Find somebody and do it in community. There's power in that for us to find rest in Jesus. That's it. You know, I've been in, ending everything during this time of streaming, and I'm going to tell you about it sometime soon, but I'm going to end, I'm going to end that way now. Shalom, church.